and hi Manreet. Hi Preeti. Uh, Manreet, Manreet Sodi Someshwar's new book, Lahore, the first of her trilogy on partition, is an extremely engaging read, uh, bringing alive the months before partition from the Macken Delhi, those and all also those who inhabit the gullies and the kuchas of Lahore. Uh, it's an ominous narrative as it continues and as it unfolds what is about to hit the subcontinent. Uh, the arbitrary line, the slicing up of the subcontinent, and then the killings and the arson and the rape and all the horrors that unfold. Um, so right, uh, my first question to you, Manreet, would be your deep connect with Punjab. And, uh, you know, so uh, you're always writing about the, you know, uh, the state, its stories. You're writing about your own connections with uh, Punjab. And this, of course, is one of the most deeply traumatic stories about uh, Punjab, about the subcontinent, about the country. Yes. But I'd like you to begin with that, your connection. Yeah. Uh, so. So to answer your question, I, it's it's part of my answer would be twofold. One is, of course, my personal connection uh, with Punjab, with Firozpur, uh, my hometown. And the other is the why of it. So let me start uh, with first my connection. I grew up in a border town, which is smack on the border between India and Pakistan. It's called Firozpur. And uh, by the laws of partition, it should have gone to Pakistan because it was a Muslim majority town. But, you know, we will not speculate as to why and how. It stayed on uh, within uh, the west, eastern Punjab, which is uh, part of India today. So I grew up with stories of uh, partition literally every household. Uh, you could say I breathed the air of partition while growing up in Firozpur. And the other thing was that I didn't find those stories in the textbooks or in the partition literature that I read. Nothing at all. We do have partition literature, but I think it's very sparse compared to you know, what I was growing up with. And then my adolescence happened when uh, you know, the Sikh militancy, so-called Sikh militancy happened. You know. And I watched it very closely because my father was a criminal lawyer. In fact, I tell people that what mm -hmm. Gulzar Saab shows in marches is pretty much what I saw growing up. Anyway, I, you know, as a child, you are interested more in academics and I moved away. I did engineering, went to a management school, had a corporate career, and I came to writing very late. And that is when I had moved out of India. And for some reason, I felt a desire to write down these memories, these stories which kept bubbling up within me and which I couldn't read anywhere. The other reason as to why I have spent 20 years researching and writing about this era is because to be very honest, people don't know about partition. They know about the independence of India. And mm. 15th August is rightly celebrated for the freedom uh, that came. But nobody talks about partition. And my reckoning is that we haven't reckoned with partition yet. Partition is not in the past. It's not. It's very much in the present. And I feel in many ways we have turned. The wheel has turned. And what we are witnessing right now in our social milieu is very reminiscent of what happened at mm. that time. So for me personally, the idea of the Partition Trilogy is to write these books and be dealt with it. Believe me, after this, there is going to be no more Partition stories. I'm going to move on. And just to clarify, there are three books in the trilogy. The first one is Lahore, which looks at the nine months leading up to the independence and partition of India. But the other two books do not deal with Punjab. They are Hyderabad and Kashmir. In fact, if people will look at the book on the back, we have the two covers. And these are really the two princely states, two, two large, the largest princely states, which were still to be integrated into India. Because the assumption when people look at the map of India is today is this is the India that the British left us. And it's again one of those fallacies. It is not. Uh, and I want to talk about how, uh, in a fictional story, tell how these two states came to be integrated, Hyderabad is, and Kashmir, as we all know, where we are situated. So what I saying was, since I'm in Amritsar a lot of the time, uh, it's very interesting what you say, because the city of Lahore seems to live on in the city of Amritsar. I always get that feeling, because there is such a similarity in so many ways. There's language, there's food, there's all this love of Shero Shairi, 
um the fact the border is so close to us just 35 km uh it's extremely you know it feels like a very live uh, thing uh do you want to tell me about that this close connection between the two cities yeah so you know the uh, as you say of amritsar i feel that in uh, firozpur even now because in some senses it is a border town and it is a less glamorous cousin of amritsar and it is a cantonment town which means you know there is a large military presence and i was very young but i still have memories of 1971 you know when the war happened and we had to flee but literally i grew up on pakistan tv broadcasts uh, at that time uh, you know doordarshan used to be out of uh, i think amritsar but the broadcast from ptv which was in lahore was much stronger uh, much clearer and i grew up with that i grew up with ghazal hour every evening in my house because my parents would sit and listen to the ptv broadcast i grew up in pakistan tv series my tata ji my father's elder brother to whom the book is dedicated i grew up with his stories of lahore of fc college of you know uh, the that place was always a part of him and to his dying days he used to receive letters uh, from his friends whom he had left behind in lahore and to till the early 80s the border was porous people were allowed trade was allowed across the borders people could go back and forth and visit it's only during the period of militancy that we uh, the border started to be clamped down and so for a uh, um, the idea that just because you put a boundary line and you can split people apart is a very modern nation, nation state idea but as i was telling somebody the other day whether you know bulla doesn't change whether rabi sings him or abida parveen sings uh, him and when i was growing up in firozpur even to this day there is a mithai shop called kasuri on the hatti for the longest time i assumed yeah that's yeah. you know the shop's name it's only later when i started doing my oral research that i realized that family had fled from kasur which is literally a tonga ride from firozpur kasur is the hometown of baba bullesha and you know that kind of the idea that you draw a line and people will suddenly change and will become others is not true not even to this day i mean you just have to open the borders and realize how people really see each other as the brother or the sister on the other side at least that's the way i always grew up and i see it to this day i remember on basant panchmi you know and would be the kite flying festival and my father was very good at flying kites and we were little children and my brother would egg my father you know when he started to lose his kites he would egg my father to fly a kite and do some uh, you know pecha with the other guys and uh, take their kites and my father would always at the end of the day uh, very morosefully remember he would say the kite can go across to the fields in pakistan i can't i still can't go across So yeah I mean you know this notion that you can kind of split people apart I find it ridiculous I feel if the powers be tomorrow open the borders all the problems at least a large majority would get resolved because the people have an interest in meeting each other definitely yeah and uh, tell us a little bit about this extensive amount of research because I think was uh, listening to something that you had said that you spent about two decades was it reading and researching around all of this because there is so much detail there is so much you know all the tiny little filling up of the vast canvas that you uh, you know undertake to do to write about tell us about what went in the creating of this book yeah so the thing is when i had the idea of writing a book like this i realized that there was very little that i really knew and which is why uh, which was in early 2000 and i started to therefore go to the libraries to the archives to teach myself i was first interested in why 84 had happened why the militancy had come about which took me back to 47 which took me back further it was my own attempt to understand and get a sense of this narrative also at a point i realized that as i said people know very little about partition we know very little about our political leaders i mean we see them as these portraits that mm. we hang on the walls we will have some statues here and there but really what do we know about jawaharlal nehru what do we know about vallabhbhai patel i mean i i was astonished when i started doing the research that vallabhbhai patel for instance he started school at the age of 8 he matriculated at the age of 22 he became a barrister in uk he was called to the bar at law at the age of 37 and by 42 and he went on to become a most 
successful practicing barrister before giving it all up to join the Congress Party. You know, the, these are things, so my attempt was twofold. One was I wanted to write a narrative, tell a story where the political leaders and the Aam Admi and Aurat share the same stage. And mm -hmm. that's what I do in Lahore, mm -hmm. where the Aam Admi Aurat are in Lahore. That's what I do in Hyderabad, where they are in Hyderabad, not the city of Hyderabad, the princely state of Hyderabad, which was very large and had parts of Karnataka, uh, Tamil Nadu, as we know it today. And I do the same thing in Kashmir. Because the idea is to try and understand how decisions are being taken in Delhi and how they are impacting the people on the ground. And to be able to do, do that, I have to portray uh, Jawaharlal Nehru as a regular person, as a family man. What does he think? You know, what are his thoughts? What, what is Hindu, who is really the Indira Gandhi that we come to learn later, was his housekeeper. And Sanjay Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi were very tiny at that time. Yeah. And most people don't know, but Jawaharlal Nehru used to have nightmares. He didn't sleep very well. He would wake up with you know, nightmares. And the idea of uh, as partition is approaching and all the challenges have to be dealt with. You know, he used to sleep very little. So the attempt is to really capture the things that make these people human, to show people that they are also human beings who were wrestling with things which were changing on a daily basis and how when the charger of time was galloping towards 15th August, how they were being forced to take the decisions and how the impact yeah. was playing out on the ground. So yes, it's taken 20 years of my life. Uh, yeah, my that's one of, yeah. Up, my daughter has grown up along with the research and you know, she used to think for the longest time that I held seances where I spoke to dead men and that's what I was doing, literally. Actually, one of the things that I really enjoyed was all these, you know, very intimate kind of family scenes that you create in the book. Uh, and I really was wondering uh, half the time whether this really happened or not. So oh, yeah, yeah. among oh, that yeah, is exactly. that, you know, the mongoose, the oh, Neola yes. scenes. Absolutely. Uh, with I, these, stories have so been written, yeah. these stories have been written with absolute rigor yeah, and accuracy. And uh, in fact, I want to tell people that the, uh, the approach I use is something called critical fabulation, which is a term which has been con coined by a Harvard academic uh, called Sadia Hartman, in which what you do is you basically do all your research. And then on that mm -hmm. very critical scaffolding is where you start building the narrative, which is really putting the flesh on the bones. But every right. single thing in this book is accurate. I will not go into the details how much it has been vetted before it came into print and became this book, the kind of uh, vetting that has been done. And my idea really is that people pick up the book and read it to understand our history and what has happened. Yeah, but these are just the little, uh, I don't know, the sort of wonderful stuff that one does not normally find uh, in a book, especially if you're reading about partition history, then, you know, it's unusual. And that I think just creates this atmosphere and makes the person so much more, uh, like you said, you're actually creating a real human, a person with different characteristics and facets. And it's not just a portrait hanging on a wall, just like what you said. Um, the other person that I really liked uh, in the book is Kishan Singh. Uh, you know, the uh, he's a clerk in the railways. And uh, somehow, again, somebody with sensibilities, apart from uh, being his, uh, you know, the, the occupation and the job, but there's also the other side of him with his daughters at home cooking because he, his wife has uh, died. Um, you know, the way he's looking after his uh, home and the girls, I found that really endearing. Uh, was he fashioned on somebody or... He really seemed like such a lovely man. Yeah, I'm glad uh, you enjoyed reading Kishan Singh. Uh, with, with Kishan Singh, my... Uh, uh, so Kishan Singh has an older brother who's called Iqbal, right? Iqbal Singh, who has fought in World War I. And Kishan and Iqbal are, in a sense, the, the archetypes of uh, fathers or men that we have. Certainly we do in Punjab. One is the macho guy. And the other is a gentler person. Mm -hmm. And Kishan is a gentler person. Mm -hmm. And Iqbal Singh is the macho guy who has gone to uh, battle and come back. Um, the idea behind creating this was because in a lot of partition literature, uh, it's common to see Punjabi men portrayed as aggressively uh, machoistic. Macho. You know, they are very masculine. 
And to an extent, it is understandable because Punjab did supply, uh, you know, in World War I, half a million soldiers. Yeah. In World War II, over a one million soldiers went from Punjab to fight the two world wars. And these men were mostly Muslim or Sikhs because, you know, the British regarded them as the martial race. So the idea that these men have the swagger and the walk tall is, is a very common portrayal. But from my own experience of growing up in Punjab, uh, from my own experience of talking to a lot of people while doing oral research, they were also this person who did not want to pick up a sword, who did not want to fight, who wanted to resolve things. And I wanted to pour all that into Kishan to have a person who, Kishan also has more communist leanings, He's not, he doesn't wear his religion uh, on his sleeve. His identity is a Sikh because that's the way he's been brought up. But he doesn't really think like a fundamentalist. He's also a person who is the father of three daughters and his wife has passed away, as you said. And, and he's also a budding poet. He, he likes poetry. So I was trying to capture how a person mm. like this, when dealing with the rumors that are gathering about the new Pakistan, which will get created, when people will be thrown out of their homes, when their daughters may be forcefully married off, converted. How does he deal with this? And I won't give, you know, sort of the end away, but it, it was my attempt to see how a person like that deals with this. And I think I have, while growing up, certainly, my father was very much a Kishan Singh character. Uh, my Tayaji, uh, who, who, to whom really Lahore is uh, dedicated, was very much a person like that. And I wanted to bring that thread out in the narrative. Um, the other thing, of course, you, you talked about the soldiers and the kind of uh, uh, atmosphere, atmosphere in uh, all of that region at that time, because of course there was animosity, there was a, a growing feeling of unease already. And uh, uh, despite the fact that you begin at the start of the book with people of different faiths, they are friends, they, uh, you know, they eat and drink together, they live together, all of that, but then slowly how all of that changes into the sense of unease that is growing. As uh, people keep wondering whether, uh, you know, where is this line going to be and will Lahore fall into uh, Pakistan or will it be in India and all of that. So um, there is also this feeling of uh, that the British are actually uh, fair-minded people and uh, Angres hain, to everything is going to go well. And the minute the Angres goes, God knows what's going to happen. So, you know, this whole thing of, of the British being fair-minded, but actually not. And how you manage to create that, because it is, you do it, you know, in this very subtle fashion. That's what comes across. You know, it was not uncommon when I was growing up to still hear elderly men not women, elderly mm. men say, Angrezi time to tinga sila. It was better during the time of the English. I don't know if we can still hear it, but I certainly remember till the late 80s, I, I would hear people saying that. And it would always baffle me. Uh, why? Why are people saying that? And uh, through, through the writing of Lahore as well, the idea is to explore what the British meant, what the Raj meant, and also in a very specific place of Punjab or the Raj meant. And, you know, the, the, the British Raj, for instance, in Punjab, uh, they call it the Punjab, for instance. It, it, there is no other state which is called the, Madhya, the United Provinces. Uh, it is the Punjab. And the reason for that is that the British actually, the relationship between Punjabis and British had become very symbiotic in the sense that one and the other were both gaining from each other's uh, nexus, from that confluence. The British, for instance, helped, uh, you know, the entire region in Western Punjab called Lyalpur, which, uh, you know, the Americans would compare to the Iowa, which is sort of, uh, you know, the most fertile land uh, from which a lot of the Sardars and the Sikhs had to flee because mm -hmm. when they came back, they were soldiers from World War I who were given this scrub land and the British had begun the system of <coughs> irrigation and creating canals. And it was these soldiers who had actually irrigated and made the land fertile. And then in 47, they were told to just leave and, and go away. Um, so the idea that, is, and a lot of, as I said, soldiers went to the wars. And what does going to war mm -hmm. do? It exposes you to the 
other world, to the outer world, to the larger world. It also makes you a trained killer because you're a person who has weapons mm. and who has learned to fire those weapons. It also builds this culture of machismo, of masculinity amongst the men. And I do feel that uh, with all that confluence, what happened was the British, when it came to their interests and during, uh, as the months uh, led to partition, the British were very clear that they were going to leave India. In fact, when Mountbatten came, the date for departure was capped at 30th June, 1948. But we know partition and mm -hmm. independence happened 10 months earlier, 15th August, 1947. Right. And the book explores why, what caused that to happen for the date to be moved forward. But what resulted was therefore that the kind of civil war which had already begun amongst people of different faiths, there was no British police or army on the ground to lay the rules. See, the people had always assumed that Sarkar hai, British was the Sarkar, and the Sarkar mm. would lay the rules, and the Sarkar would ensure everything worked. Mm. The Sarkar just decamped, they were just out, and the British were very clear that as long as no white man, woman, or child is hurt, we're going to be out. And we will lead India to the chaos of it. In fact, Gandhi said that it's time for you to go. If it's our chaos, we will deal with it. Mm. But nobody had anticipated. Mm. Where, you know, it's like there's a lid on something which the British were keeping. The moment they departed, the lid opened and all the chaos poured out. So I don't want to go into more because, as you said, it's all there in the book. And I'm trying to show through the narrative how these assumptions that we had about the British just fell apart. And the other thing I think which was also very important in the book is this relationship between Nehru and Vallabhai Patel. And also that Balkan, the plan that uh, was originally thought about by the British of really dividing up the country and, you know, that whole moth eaten kind of country, which we would have then inherited right. or then been given. And how Vallabhai Patel actually uh, uh, tried to um, work around this thing and uh, change the course of uh, the way the map would be, you know, the, the map of India. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Preeti, because I find I'm so confounded when people are, you know, in, in social media, especially putting Jawaharlal Nehru against Vallabhai Patel. And honestly, there is, there is nothing to pit one against the other. They were fundamentally different people. They had very different upbringing. They had very different ways of thinking. But the fact is that they were a team. In fact, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was the Prime Minister, Vallabhai Patel was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister. Mm -hmm. They were, of course, 15 years apart. And uh, Vallabhai Patel clearly took Jawaharlal Nehru as the leader of the country going forward. And the two of them worked in close proximity. In fact, there is a quote in the book where they said that Bapu has tied us like a pair of oxen to the cart which is leading to India's independence. And the other common assumption people make is, oh, the map of India that we see today is the map that the British left us with. And this couldn't be further from the truth. The mm. British had no interest in the territorial integrity of India. World War II had bankrupted Britain. They just wanted to wash their hands and flee. So what do they do? They're coming up with these plans. And these plans are from their experience of dealing with Europe. In Europe, they had done something called the Plan Balkan, where they had split mm this country apart, and they thought they could apply the same to India. So the plan was Hindustan, Pakistan, Princestan. Now, Princestan, again, there were 565 princely states, some large, some small, but they were all there. And under this plan, they were given the option, they could join India, they could join Pakistan, they could be independent, they could form a coalition of their own. And just to give people an idea, because close to half of those 565 states were in the state of Gujarat. Mm -hmm. So imagine today you're traveling from Ahmedabad to Baroda by car. You would have to stop every 10 kilometers because there would be a check post, a border check post. You would have to show your visa, your passport to enter. Just imagine the kind of state, country, a nation state India would have been left with. And when Vallabhai Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru realized that this was the option they were giving, they realized that they had to do everything possible to speak with each individual ruler and coax them into joining India. Because the majority of these states were also Hindu majority and ruled by Hindu Maharajas. 
But you know how the Maharajas are. They have no allegiance to the modern nation state which these Congress people are forming, who in many cases mm-hmm. were not their allies. The Raja saw the Raj, the Queen, the British Crown, the King as their as their um, sort of master. They, they did not want to have anything to do with the Congress party. So between Vallabhai Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel decided he would do that because he was also a person. Jawaharlal Nehru was a socialist at heart. He did not like the princes. They hated him. So Vallabhai Patel, along with VP Menon, who did a sterling job, and Dicky Mountbatten, formed this trio who spoke to each person and started ruling them within India. And remember, at this time, uh, Jinnah was very keen to get the princes to accede to him. And Junagar is a fabulous story because Junagar was a Hindu uh, a majority place and a Hindu Maharaja, and he decides to accede to Pakistan. And if you know where Junagar sits in India today, Vallabhai Patel said that Junagar would be uh, the heart of the dagger which is pointing towards Hyderabad because Hyderabad was ruled by the Nizam who was the wealthiest man in India at that time. And, and that's why the story really is exciting because so come 15th August, uh, the trio of Vallabhai Patel, Dicky Mountbatten, B.P. Menon have got all the princely state to accede to India, um, barring one which went to Pakistan and which was Muslim majority. But we have Junagar, Hyderabad and Kashmir which are not. So Junagar gets resolved very quickly, uh, and that I cover in, in the books which will yeah. follow. Yeah. But Hyderabad was a huge thing, and Vallabhai Patel was particularly perturbed because he said it is a, like a cancer in the belly of India, because it is a huge state smack in the center of India. Imagine that part today if it was not part of India. It right. was an independent yeah. state. Mm. And, and similarly with Kashmir. So it was an extraordinary achievement, and I'm hoping that when people read these books, they get to know a little more of what actually went on in 1947 instead of, you know, sending out these tweets which have really no element of truth to them. But very quickly, I don't know how we are doing for time and whether I can actually ask you because I have a couple more questions which I think I should ask. Um, One is, of course, this whole harking back to the Mahabharat, uh, you know, which is also there in your last book, In Radiance. And here too, it is obviously the story of, you know, two clans, two brothers pitted against each other and nobody's ever going to get the better of this battle. Um, Much like uh, I think you also say something about go take your empire. That is something that Duryodhan is saying to Yudhishthar. So it is literally that, that you take the empire, but, um, you know, you're not really going to get any joy out of it because partition or what is happening, this divisiveness between communities is something that's going to stay. So the two questions are connected from the Mahabharat to to present day when we see an increase in this kind of divisiveness in society. And it is in a manner, the seeds sown at partition which are playing out even now, we can never forget. So if you could just bring us up to date to today. Right. So the Mahabharat, for instance, is, uh, you know, it is such a foundational text of India And as you said, I brought it out in Radiance as well. And I like to tell people because, again, we have the common assumption that Mahabharata is something to do with the Hindu faith, the Hindu religion. It is exclusively exclusively Hindu. And Mahabharata is a foundation. It's a cultural underpinning of the subcontinent. And in fact, to large parts of Southeast Asia as well. If you go to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, you see influences there as well. And... I like to remind people that uh, Mahabharat, in a sense, uh, Ved Vyasa, the Battle of Kurukshetra, they're all in what is erstwhile Punjab. They're all very much, that is the cradle of where it comes from. So the idea that the Punjabis would, for some reason, not be familiar with it is, you know, it's just sheer ignorance. Also, uh, you know, when when we read letters which soldiers wrote back home during World War II and World War I, we can find a lot of references to the Mahabharat. And in fact, I bring one of them here with Sepoy Malik. Because if you've not seen something before, then the way you refer to it is by stuff that you know. So he talks mm. about when these bombs come whizzing out of the air, they remind him of Garuda, you know, which is, mm. uh, which is the bird from the Mahabharat. And so that is from the common people. From the leaders, Mahatma Gandhi was always worried that as the, you know, the days of independence and partition were nearing, that while everybody was familiar with the story of the Mahabharata, what they had done was that they had forgotten 
what is mahabharat it is the story of the battle for dharma and bapu always said that people were remembering the battle they had forgotten the dharma behind it mm. and he says it repeatedly in fact um, when 15th august happened and you know people were driven out of their homes a lot of delhi uh, muslims who were driven out of their homes uh, by the sikhs and the hindus settled as refugees huddled in purana kila and bapu went to meet them and he said tell me how this is not like the mahabharat because in the mahabharat the pandavas actually took shelter in purana kila mm. so there are very very clear lines that we can draw from the two millennial or more old foundational story of our uh, culture to the lines today mm. and this battle between brothers uh, because finally all battles and this is again something which psychologists talk about uh, ashish uh, nandi has talked who is a sociologist has spoken about mahatma gandhi said that all battle is battle between brothers and that is what we are seeing to this day mm. we are seeing the same seeds that me and the other you're not my brother you are the other why because maybe you dress differently you wear a turban you don't wear a turban uh, you know and and that's why i say partition is in our blood it is next year we will mark 75 years of independence i hope we also mark 75 years of partition and try to think how present it is in everyday india yep you know so which is the last question that uh, of course it's a trilogy you have two more books coming but why at this particular time uh, to my mind it feels as though it's also that the idea of india uh, seems to be under peril or under threat of some you know terrible forces and uh, the divisiveness along communal religious lines is increasing so much and maybe this is a way of remembering like you said of marking and of understanding um because in this book of course there is dislocation there is identity or a search for that and there's memory there is trauma there are the wounds of history um there are communities that are being you know they are killing each other hurting each other there's the concept of nation a new nation being created and of course there is partition and trauma and the wounds of partitions so i mean it covers a huge um, landscape and i really want to congratulate you on that and uh, it's uh, really wonderfully written thank uh, you thank and you. i mean and the, the 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 scope is enormous and i'm sure the next two books are also going to be all of that but Uh, so my last question is uh, why at this point and then maybe we open it up to audience questions it's a wonderful question i don't know if i have a straight forward single answer uh, you know my motivations are as complex as layered as india as the idea of india i think at one at one extent uh, lahore and then hyderabad and kashmir are also to bring to our memories all the people who lost um, you know in this cataclysm the loves the friendships uh, that were destroyed i want to bring uh, i'm not saying that kishan singh actually existed but people like kishan singh lived and what a writer does is to uh, hopefully bring when you bring them to pages you make them live again so uh, i'm trying to make both the political leaders live again to really make them come alive and i'm also trying to make the arm army and or especially the women because i feel that women get written out of history all the time and i'm trying to bring the women to these pages so uh, when people read it they can empathize they can try and visualize a past that did exist that is hopefully not lost to us because there are ways to you know rebuild that past mm-hmm. i also feel that uh, you know as i said i uh, w- I guess I witnessed a lot of trauma when I was growing up from the stories of people and I wanted to pour it all out I wanted to find a place for it because right now I live in New York City which is sort of the home of the Jewish diaspora and every year there are multiple books that come out fiction non fiction great literature that is exploring the holocaust this is our holocaust what are we doing where is the conversation around it uh, and I think that art uh whether it's literature dance conversations is the only thing that can really save us 
And unless we start talking about those issues, unless we start airing them, we will not know that we have been down this path before and that this is a very, very dangerous path. And I also want people to think about the freedom that we take for granted. It didn't come easy. We need yeah. to remember what all went into it. So, you know, I hope that answers uh, some of your question. Uh, and I, I think the time is rife. You know, a writer doesn't plan to have their books come out at a particular time. As I said, when I was satisfied that I knew everything that I wanted to know is when I started writing it. And fortunately for me and my publisher, the three books will actually straddle the 75th year of uh, independence and partition because Lahore uh, came out this year, Hyderabad will come out next year and inshallah Kashmir after that. And my hope is that people read it and you know talk about the book, talk about characters. Hopefully it makes them think uh, you know, about all that we take for granted. Thank you very much, Manreet. And uh, open now for audience questions. We have one audience question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, oh. Hey, can you guys hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, it's incredible that you did 20 years of research. That's incredible. I just, uh, I started reading uh, Integration of the Indian States by B.P. Menon recently. And the chapters on Junagadh and Jammu and Kashmir read, read like thrillers. I mean, they're incredible chapters. I just wanted to know um, if there is a Pakistani version of of the integration or their view, a condensed view of all these accessions also, because I just wanted to see if there's also another viewpoint, a distant viewpoint from the Pakistani side uh, that you're aware of. I, I'm not aware of any particular uh, Pakistani writer who's written about the integration of Indian states, because as it happened, these princely states, as I said, were largely Hindu majority. They were ruled by Hindu Maharajas. And during the um, two and a half months, which is all that Vallabhai Patel, Dicky Mountbatten and VP Menon had to integrate these states, the uh, emphasis was all from the Indian side. Jinnah was not actively looking to have them exceed, but he was sending out feelers. So if people came to him like the Nawab of Junagar did that, hey, I would like to exceed to Pakistan. He, he, was, he was very keen. He was holding out promises or in terms of monetary compensation, in terms of how the laws that would get created for the Pakistan state would not apply to the Maharajas. So he was holding out many freebies. Uh, but the most intense uh, sort of exchange between Jinnah uh, really happens in Hyderabad, which is the next book which is going to come out. So hopefully your question will get answered in that because Jinnah really put all out to get Hyderabad to accede to Pakistan because it was ruled by a Muslim Nawab who was the wealthiest man in the world. So just ima imagine the amount of riches that would come to a newly created um, state of Pakistan if the Nizam of Hyderabad had actually acceded to India. And two, in terms of India's national security, Jinnah would have a large beachhead sitting right in the belly of India. We have an audience. Uh, so I wanted to. So we all know that uh, Junagar, Kashmir, and Hyderabad were a uh, few of the states, and which India was fighting for and came to India. I want to know about the states uh, for which we were fighting and it went to uh, Pakistan. Right. Which other states? Well. The, the, the princely states which did go to Pakistan were in the region of uh, Baluchistan, which were, which were always considered to go to Pakistan. They were considered part of the, you know, the, the landmass that would go because it was Muslim majority. Uh, it, by the laws of India's partition, those states were already assigned to go to Pakistan. Thank you, Manreet and Preeti, for that absolutely riveting conversation. Looking forward to uh, reading Lahore and everything else that uh, you're working on. Uh, and you are our closing session for the 2021 Bangalore Literature Festival. Thank you so much. And thank we'll you. see you here in person next year. Looking forward thank to that. So thank you very much, Bangalore Lit Fest, thank for you. inviting us.